news tell Go Public about the pressure they're under to sell you services you don't want or need. It's absolutely shocking. You know, it's a really a practice that is abusive. An Ottawa police officer charged with manslaughter. Plus, orphaned in Haiti. He was adopted by an Indigenous Canadian. Then his identity became a question of blood. It was very hurtful to him. Quietly, without cameras and seemingly none of the pomp of the first time, President Donald Trump signed a new executive order aimed at immigration and refugees. The old one was criticized as a ban on Muslims, and alongside international condemnation, it drew swift legal action. The new one is far from declawed, but as Paul Hunter explains, it seems designed to hold up in court. If Donald Trump thought his new and revised travel ban might mean no more demonstrations, all he had to do tonight was look out the window at those gathered in front of the White House. The new travel ban was signed by the president privately earlier in the day, aimed at surviving legal challenges and the kind of fury that came with the first ban in January. We will not go away! Those demonstrations were intense, and massive, leading to court battles that eventually nullified it and, in turn, to today's rewrite. This order is part of our ongoing efforts to eliminate vulnerabilities that radical Islamist terrorists can and will exploit for destructive ends. Emphasizing that, the order, which kicks in March 16th, is a 90-day ban on travel to the U.S. from six countries, not seven. Iraq is no longer on the list. But each of the six, Syria, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Yemen, and Sudan is predominantly Muslim. Unlike the last ban, those already approved for travel will still be allowed in. And the new directive shuts down the entire U.S. refugee program for 120 days. This executive order responsibly provides a needed pause. We can so we can carefully review how we scrutinize people coming here from these countries of concern. I am going to keep radical Islamic terrorists the hell out of our country. A travel ban was a staple of Trump's election campaign. But as with that first ban in January, that today's targets everyone from those countries, regardless whether they pose any threat, still infuriates many. This new executive order still stigmatizes the faith of Islam and Muslims. It does not make America any safer. And even as those demonstrators marched on the White House tonight, those who successfully challenged the last ban began taking a long, hard look at the new one. We're reviewing it carefully uh, and still have concerns with the new order. Uh, that said, uh, we need to take our time and make sure we have a thoughtful approach on what our next step is going to be. One likely outcome of the new travel ban is less chaos at airports. Last time, it kicked in almost immediately, catching everyone off guard, not least those at U.S. Customs. With a start date this time still 10 days away, it's plenty of time for everyone to get ready for it, including lawyers. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Republicans have revealed their plans to replace the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare. Their proposal would cover fewer Americans. It also eliminates fines for people who don't have health insurance. But it retains some of the popular consumer protections created by Obama, including safeguards for anyone with a pre-existing medical condition. Four years ago, Ben Carson called Obamacare the worst thing to happen to America since slavery. Today, Carson, now the Secretary for Housing and Urban Development, made another controversial comment about slavery. There were other immigrants who came here in the bottom of slave ships, worked even longer, even harder for less. But they too had a dream. The comment has been widely condemned. Carson made the statement in his first address to departmental employees. Voices demanding action from the Canadian government in response to the Trump travel ban are growing louder. And today's revised order did nothing to quiet them. Cases like that of a Montreal woman over the weekend 
are leading some to worry that U.S. border officials are going beyond the directive and blocking people with legal travel documents from traveling between the U.S. and Canada. Katie Simpson explains. With her closest friends by her side, Manpreet Kooner arrived at the U.S. Embassy seeking clarity. She's Canadian, born and raised, has a valid passport, and wants to know why that wasn't good enough to cross the border into Vermont for a day trip to a spa. It's upsetting. It's like you're being treated like a criminal and you're being singled out even though you haven't done anything wrong. While Cooner hasn't been given an explanation, concern is growing that crossing the border will only become more complicated in the wake of the new U.S. travel ban. I fully expect that the racial profiling that Canadians are experiencing will continue. But the public safety minister downplayed fears the executive order will cause problems for Canadian travellers to the U.S. We're going to be looking at all of the details so that we can provide Canadians with uh, complete information. Despite those reassurances, the NDP stepped up calls for the prime minister to speak out against Trump and to suspend the safe third country agreement with the U.S. to make it easier for refugees to claim asylum in Canada. Does he believe that the U.S. remains a safe country for refugees, yes or no? Uh, we are an open and welcoming country and we continue uh, to demonstrate that we truly believe that diversity is a source of strength. Canadians expect a Prime Minister with the courage to stand up against a racist executive order. Justin Trudeau avoided criticizing Trump while the immigration minister stood by the current plan. It would be irresponsible to withdraw from the safe third country agreement. But some suggest the U.S. isn't following the principles of the agreement. They are not living to their you know, piece of the bargain in this particular agreement by upholding their international rights obligations in properly assessing refugee claimants. Professor Jamie Liu says the effects of the Canadian order will no doubt be felt in Canada. I think it's pretty clear that um, it means that more people are going to be crossing the border. Chances are slim the Liberals will suspend the safe third country agreement. Changing the policy could be seen as a knock toward the Trump administration. And that's not something the Trudeau government is interested in doing publicly. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. The government says it's too early to call the increase in refugee claimants to Canada a trend. But the numbers so far this year are striking, especially at land crossings in Quebec. 724 people made refugee claims in February after arriving at the border. Seven times the number in February 2016. The January number was more than double. And that doesn't include asylum seekers who crossed the U.S.-Canada border illegally. An American Gold Star father who spoke out during the U.S. election campaign about Donald Trump's treatment of Muslims has cancelled an appearance in Canada. Have you even read the United States Constitution? I will gladly lend you my copy. Kazir Khan was scheduled to speak in Toronto tomorrow about tolerance, unity, and the rule of law. He told talk organizers that he was notified last night that his travel privileges are being reviewed. He says he was not given a reason why. Khan became an American citizen 30 years ago. His son was killed by a suicide bomber while serving for the U.S. in Iraq. Now, as a rule, U.S. Customs and Border Protection does not contact travelers in advance of their travel out of the United States. The government's extending Canada's military mission in Ukraine. Operation Unifier will continue until the end of March 2019. Canada, Britain and the U.S. have had military trainers in Ukraine since the summer of 2015 after Russia invaded and annexed Crimea. Coming up, in Flint, Michigan, adults keep an agonizing watch for kids with signs of lead poisoning. He could have cognitive problems and behavioral problems. Plus, a sudden terror attack puts leaders on the hot seat. I knew that many people had died in New York, but that was not the focus. We talked to Canadians in charge during 9-11. Last July, Ottawa police were called to a coffee shop. Responding to reports, a man was harassing and assaulting customers. Shortly after that, Abdi Rahman Abdi was confronted by police Witnesses say the arrest was violent. 
The next day, Abdi was pronounced dead. The incident sparked outrage, protests, and now a constable is charged with manslaughter. Judy Trin reports. The arrest of Abdurrahman Abdi was captured on video. The mentally ill Somali Canadian died after a violent confrontation with Ottawa police. Today, after an eight month probe, Ontario's police watchdog laid charges. 36 year old Ottawa Police Constable Daniel Moncion faces charges of manslaughter, aggravated assault, and assault with a weapon. The family's lawyer says no comfort comes from this. You not only have uh, the incredible grief that we really can't understand unless we go through it ourselves. Last July, police responded to a Sunday morning call about an alleged groping at a nearby coffee shop. Abdi was chased half a block to his apartment building where he was cornered by two officers. Abdi was pepper sprayed, punched and hit with batons. His mother had to be restrained after seeing her son's arrest from inside the lobby doors. The takedown was also captured by the building's security cameras, video that hasn't been made public. Witnesses told CBC that Abdi didn't fight back and that the use of force elevated after Monsian, an anti-gang officer, arrived. The community felt that if Abdi Haman was from a different uh, race or from a different uh, community, that um, the way the police officers would have handled the situation would have been totally different. Racial tensions between police and the black community have been high since Abdi's death. The police union president believes the special investigations unit was under pressure to lay charges. Also, unfortunately, it's not surprising. We, we, we expected uh, this to occur given the amount of attention garnered uh, from the incident and uh, given our history with SIU, it's not something we were surprised to see. Monsian, who has put on desk duty since the confrontation, is now suspended with pay. But as a chief, uh, it's important for me to recognize that our officers have a very difficult job to do out there each and every day. This is only the second time that the SIU has charged an Ottawa police officer with manslaughter. The last time was in 1991 when an unarmed black man was shot during a drug raid. Police mistook his guitar for a gun. That officer was acquitted. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. The head of the RCMP is calling it a career. Bob Paulson says he will retire in June. During his time as commissioner, Paulson was forced to acknowledge systemic harassment and mental health issues in the ranks. He vowed things would change, but will leave much unfinished. Alison Crawford has more. Words of thanks today for the outgoing RCMP commissioner. He's worked uh, extraordinarily hard uh, in the public interest uh, to uh, protect the safety of Canadians. Looking back, Paulson's greatest achievement would have to be in everyday police operations. Gone are the days when Mounties regularly faced inquiries over their use of force, or faulty intelligence shared with American officials that, in the case of Meher Arar, resulted in him being tortured. Paulson tightened up a slow and flabby disciplinary process, and he promised to get rid of bad apples. Some of the worst racists carry a gun, and they carry a badge, authorized by you, Commissioner Paulson. I understand that there are racists in my police force. Uh, I don't want them to be in my police force. If anything, though, workplace harassment bookends Paulson's tenure. Yeah, the harassment uh, crisis, as I'll call it, has basically sh uh, shadowed my appointment. And it never let up. MPs asked Paulson about it in 2013. Some people's ambitions exceed their abilities. I cannot lead a force that accommodates and seeks to compensate people for those unachieved ambitions. That didn't go over well, and more people came forward. In 2014, male staff complained they were being harassed and subjected to nudity at the RCMP-run Canadian Police College. Hundreds of female officers and staff alleged sexual abuse and harassment. Last fall, the RCMP settled their $100 million class action lawsuit. Another class action suit is in the works for male Mounties who say they were bullied and harassed on the job. And last week, when a judge ruled Mounties had inflicted mental suffering on one of their own, reporters asked the Prime Minister about it. Do you still have confidence in Commissioner Paulson? I, uh, uh, we, we all... Uh, are agreed, including uh, Commissioner Paulson. But Trudeau never answered the question. Add to that, labor relations are in the dumps. Mounties haven't had a raise in years, and they say RCMP brass is hurting their efforts to form a union. As for who should take over, the man who preceded Paulson, the RCMP's first civilian commissioner, Bill Elliott, told me the government should give preference to someone from within the ranks. 
Allison Crawford, CBC News, Ottawa. CBC News has learned that 46 cases have been stayed in Ontario, all because of court delays. And there are warnings it'll get worse. The cases were tossed in the last half of 2016 after the Jordan decision came down. It was designed to set reasonable time limits for trials. 18 months for provincial cases, 30 months for those in Superior Court. But with backlogs and a lack of resources, some lawyers warn it'll just mean that more cases don't get to court. There's a new top bank in Canada. After its latest profit announcement, TD has edged out RBC. But some TD employees claim getting to the top comes at a price. They say they're in a pressure cooker situation. As they put it, sign up customers for products that can get them into big financial trouble or face being fired. Erica Johnson explains in this Go Public investigation. Three longtime TD employees say they're under incredible pressure to meet quarterly sales targets that keep rising. Customers deserve to know what's being done to them at their institution. We've agreed to conceal their identities because they worry about losing their jobs. They say when customers approach the counter and punch in their pin, a star appears on the teller's screen. Click on that, the teller sees products and services the customer hasn't yet purchased. Products that help tellers reach their sales targets. They say tellers aren't always clear the products and services have fees attached. This teller demonstrates a common tactic for selling overdraft protection without mentioning the cost. Sure enough, when we visit TD branches in Vancouver with a hidden camera, well, you're free to the overdraft protection. I okay. can activate that for you right now. No mention of the fee. Five bucks every time we dip into that line of credit. At this TD, the employee suggests we sign up for a credit card we never asked for. I'm um, here. Let me sign up some credit card info. Tellers who don't meet their sales goals can be put on a performance improvement plan and eventually their employment may be terminated. Stressful even for this TD manager. I find myself waking up in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep because I know I've got to explain why this teller is not at 100%. In the hundreds of emails we've received today, TD employees talk about the pressure to sell, 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 that unrealistic expectations are causing stress leave and ulcers. We look to them to uh, basically provide a service. We don't think of banks as, I don't mean as pejoratively, but as uh, second-hand car salespeople. On Parliament Hill, the NDP's finance critic says mandating unrealistic sales goals is too much. Targeting vulnerable Canadians to drown them more into debt, absolutely uh, unacceptable. TD Bank declined to be interviewed. In a statement, it said giving tellers sales goals makes good business sense, but that employees should never sell a customer a product that doesn't fill a need. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. A status Indian from a BC First Nation has won the right to play in an all-native basketball tournament. The 21-year-old was first banned from the annual event last year after organizers deemed he wasn't Indigenous enough. His family fought back. Mira Baines picks up the story. Who is Indigenous? The question has been at the center of a controversial decision to deny Josiah Wilson from playing in the all-native basketball tournament. Wilson's family is now claiming victory after taking their complaint to the BC Human Rights Tribunal. I'm particularly happy for my son because now he can play basketball with his teammates and he can represent our nation at the next all-native basketball tournament and I think that's worth celebrating. Dr. Don Wilson is part of BC's Halsic First Nation. While working in Haiti, he adopted Josiah as a baby, just five months old. Josiah was raised as a member of the Halsic First Nation. We went so far as to seek support from our, my own nation, our own nation, asking for um, letters to confirm that he's a registered band member. He had already provided his status card uh, as proof that he is a registered status Indian. The family was shocked when the 21-year-old was sent a letter barring him from playing in the all-native basketball tournament. Not be allowed to represent our nation, it was very hurtful him and I wasn't about to let that pass without some kind of a response. 
Organizers claimed he didn't have North American indigenous blood, so he couldn't play for an indigenous team. The rule stated that participants had to be born with at least one-eighth indigenous blood. Organizers with the all-native basketball tournament say after legal consultation, some indigenous leaders were flabbergasted to learn their own rules were outdated. We realized that the country has changed some rules and um, there's, uh, if you're adopted by a First Nations family, then in the eyes of our country, you're considered First Nations. This legal expert says the case shows that First Nations should be defining who they are. It is a fundamental issue of sovereignty and self-determination for First Nations and Indigenous communities to be able to determine who their, who their membership is. A formal apology has been sent to Josiah and his family. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. World leaders are condemning North Korea's latest missile launches. Three of the missiles flew about 1,000 kilometers and landed in Japanese waters, as close as 300 kilometers off its northwest coast. North Korean media reports the intended target was U.S. military bases in Japan. Pyongyang had promised retaliation over joint U.S.-South Korea military drills. The intense battle by U.S.-backed Iraqi forces trying to take back the city of Mosul continues. Today, a strategic gain from ISIS, a second of the city's five bridges. Hundreds more civilians fled the city today. They say they were nearly starved to death and had no human rights under the militant group. There's always a certain health risk with traveling in the Caribbean and Latin America, Zika being the most recent big scare. We haven't heard as much about the virus lately, but new research shows it packs a much bigger punch than previously thought. As our health reporter Christine Birak tells us, experts are now warning Canadians to stay on their guard. For travelers jetting off to fun in the sun, Zika virus isn't exactly top of mind. I like to live in uh, ignorant bliss sometimes. <laughs> Seems like it's completely dropped out of the news. But a new study looking at Canadian travelers has put Zika back in the headlines. Among infected Canadians who became ill, researchers found the virus led to more severe complications than expected. Most people with Zika will remain completely asymptomatic, but in those who develop symptoms, we were a bit surprised to see that rate of complicated illness. Researchers looked at more than 1,100 sick travelers who visited specialists across the country. 41 had Zika. Two patients experienced partial paralysis. Three pregnant women were also infected, and two passed the virus on to their unborn babies, which can lead to serious birth defects. In total, 10% of Zika cases resulted in severe complications. Some doctors argue while it's unique Canadian data, the results aren't all that surprising. But experts do agree we don't know a lot about Zika, including its effects on very young children. Many insist Canada needs a national system tracking the virus. What the, the infection looks like, where it is, where the outbreaks are, and how we can um, do things to prevent Zika infection and transmission, but also if there's ways that we can intervene um, during pregnancy to try to improve outcomes for mothers and their babies and we don't know any of that information yet. Doctors say their advice to travelers is simple. Pregnant women should avoid going to countries with active Zika transmission. Everyone else should pack a powerful mosquito repellent which can protect against other viruses including dengue and malaria which can be deadly. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well straight ahead a terror attack puts leaders in a pressure cooker. We'll hear how they coped on 9-11 and what's changed since then. I am sure you agree that we should talk frankly to each other. Frankness in good spirit is a measure of friendship. The issues and irritants that inevitably affect all neighbors are small indeed in comparison with the issues that we face together. Our friendship is deep and our understanding is great, but we have many problems, of course. But a day which also saw what looked like the beginning of a fundamental friendship between Mr. Trudeau and President Nixon. This is a new era of consultation and, we hope, cooperation. 
some American officials seemed appalled as Canadian security allowed demonstrators within yards of the first meeting between Prime Minister Trudeau and the President. Canadians expect much of Americans, but more important, Canadians have faith in the Americans. The Prime Minister was here to tell President Reagan what he was telling Canadian voters for the past few months, that he wants to restore not just good relations, but what he calls super relations between Canada and the US. From President Clinton, there was no limit to the praise and the admiration he expressed for Prime Minister Chrétien. Under your wise leadership, Mr. Prime Minister, relations between the United States and Canada have never been closer or more constructive. He's a good guy, I, and I enjoyed to be with him. Four years, three weeks, and two days since first being elected U.S. President, and George Bush said hello to Canada. I frankly felt like the reception we received on the way in from the airport was very warm and hospitable, and I want to thank the Canadian people who came out to wave with all five fingers for... Uh... <laughs> Obama! Obama! The purpose of the trip was that Stephen Harper and Barack Obama have some time to get to know each other and discuss whether they shared an agenda and some objectives. Uh, I came to Canada on my first trip as president to underscore the closeness and importance of the relationship between our two nations. We see ourselves in each other. We're guided by the same values. And like all great, enduring friendships, at our best, we bring out the best in one another. I have to say that having gone through it and looked back, um, you don't get a second chance to react. For political leaders and military commanders, the toughest, most stressful part of the job is protecting national security, forced to make life and death decisions, usually with very little time. Last week, we told you about secret documents obtained by CBC News outlining Operation Noble Eagle, Canada's plan to prevent a 9-11 style attack. But dealing with terrorist threats has become complicated in the past decade, Murray Brewster spoke with some of the Canadian officials who held the responsibility to make the decision. Vice President has cleared us to intercept tracks. You know what they do? Uh, shoot them down if they do not respond. Those words do not lose their power, even with the passage of time. It is a fateful order that no one wants to give, but some may have to. It's not a day that I wake up that I don't feel the weight of responsibility, but we're... Um, you know, we're, we're trained to deal with it. There's a lump in your throat when, when you're thinking, I mean, maybe what, I'm, what I've just said or what I've written or, or what I've provided might lead to something. What if I'm wrong? Move it, come on. Up until 2001, the idea a hijacked commercial airliner could be turned into a flying bomb belonged to the realm of Tom Clancy fiction. 9-11 changed that. One of my officials put a note right in front of me, which is very unusual. It said, there's been a tragedy. So I wound up my speech, and then I heard the news that a plane had gone into one of the World Trade Towers in New York. And immediately, my feeling was, well, that had to be an act of terrorism. During September 11th, it was up to David Colinette as Minister of Transport to help clear the skies of other potential threats and he had to steer jets away from population centers, landing transatlantic flights quickly along the East Coast. And then we didn't have any information. We came to the conclusion that by landing in Toronto or Montreal that um, we were really uh, courting a, a further risk. We had to get these planes down. I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, uh, destination. Okay. Region commander has declared that we can shoot down tracks that cannot respond to our uh, direction. It was a chaotic situation on 9-11 as it would be today. And when it comes down to it, someone has to make the final fateful call, shoot or don't shoot. From the moment of intercept to the time the order is given to pull the trigger, it is breathtakingly short. 
It would naturally involve the Chief of Defence Staff, the Prime Minister and possibly the RCMP Commissioner. All of it would depend on circumstances and who was available. John Manley was Deputy Prime Minister in the years following 9-11 and knows how that feels. Well, the burden is quite significant. Um, I, my personal experience was that I had occasions when I had military personnel with me 24-7, including in my house while I was asleep because they would need me as part of the chain of command. In order to make the call, you need good intelligence. It was important during 9-11 and even more so now. You're only as good as the accuracy of your own information. So, As a former CSIS analyst during 9-11, Phil Gursky knows that awful responsibility. The scramble to piece together an incomplete, sometimes incomprehensible picture. Who is this? Why are they doing it? What's the target? I'm not going to say it's a crapshoot, because that's probably inaccurate, but it makes it a lot more difficult to, to give the best advice because you simply don't know. 9-11 forced those who are paid to think about nightmare scenarios to focus more sharply. The plan of how Canadian leaders would respond and the kind of resources at their disposal was obtained in its entirety by CBC News. We have committed to withholding many of those details for reasons of national security. However, what the documents do tell us is how opaque the terrorist threat has become. After 9-11, it was all about groups like Al-Qaeda commandeering a jet. That's where the planning and expectations were aimed. But as Canadians and the world have seen, there has been an evolution in terror. All the way back on the other side of the street, please, let's go. The lone wolves like Michael Zihaf Bibo represent an important new consideration for security planners. Some may be inspired by terror groups like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, other terrorists may be more retro, or traditional hijackers with a grudge. In some respects, it would be back to the future. I have to say that having gone through it and looked back, um, you don't get a second chance to react. You, you, you just have to react. And you become very dispassionate, uh, very cool, somewhat might even say icy, because you could not get caught up with the emotions of the moment. We've got procedures that we practice uh, over and over and over again to make certain that we can uh, think as clearly as we can uh, in a crisis situation. I would say that air security incidents have a, a, a range to them. The most harmful, the potentially most harmful are very low likelihood, uh, extremely low, but they're not zero. Marie Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Up next, tense times in Flint, Michigan. All of a sudden his grades was dropping. His enthusiasm about school was like dwindling. Every change in kids' behavior could be a sign of lead poisoning. We check in with a city in long-term crisis. Finish. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Plus Syrian refugee farmers thrilled to be back on the land. Canadian scientists and their counterparts on the Soviet side of the North Pole have found out that the Arctic ice pack is slowly melting. The ocean is warming up. Its coat of ice is now only about 60% as thick as it was at the turn of the century. Polar ice will melt, and by the end of the century, this will bring floods to low-lying coastal areas. Inland, there'll be drought, and in other places, an increase in storms. Some crops could be devastated. But looking at the brighter side of things, at least our great-grandchildren should have warmer winters. Just a sample of the broad spectrum of opinion on the changes taking place in our atmosphere. Cataclysmic. Um, not a trivial matter and not one to, to be taken lightly. The greenhouse effect will wreak total havoc on the natural world. All of them are burning fossil fuels. All of them are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But if I put in too much carbon dioxide, in effect, what I'm doing is putting a dome over the entire world. The temperature begins to rise because it's being trapped, the greenhouse effect. And we can actually see it here on the thermometer just from these, these ordinary studio lights. Compounding the problem has been the systematic depletion of the world's forests. Trees need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. 
As the number of trees diminish worldwide, more carbon dioxide is left to build up in the atmosphere. The start of global warming can also mean extreme and erratic weather, and the evidence has been mounting up. Knowing what we know now, how serious it may get, I don't want to see us looking back saying, oh, we could have done this, we could have done this, but now it's too late. I think what concerns me most about global warming, I feel like we're just in a little experiment and that we're just not leaving anything for the future generations. A piece of film was supposed to have been cut to open this year's Festival of Festivals, but the organizers couldn't find any, so an old-fashioned ribbon was used instead. This evening, the gala premiere belongs to a Canadian film, Ticket to Heaven. A number of limousines have pulled up with well-dressed people, and fortunately, nobody seems to know who they are. Despite the problems, after the film, it was party time, and there was everything you'd expect at a showbiz bash. Stars, booze, good-looking women, good-looking men, people dancing to the music of Martha and the Muffins, and more booze. It's warm beady night at the Festival of Festivals, where the spotlight shines on everyone. The ushers at the theater had their hands full. It was their job to make sure the fans and the stars didn't collide. But when the big black Continental pulled up to the curb, there was no stopping the autograph hounds. I'm very proud of myself from restraining myself from attempting to wrestle him to the ground because it's exactly what I wanted to do. This was opening night, a gala for the North American premiere of Joshua Then and Now. There were Klieg lights and limousines, but there were also some charming down-home touches. The star, James Woods, arrived with his proud parents, who came in from Rhode Island for the event. Now, the oh-so-cool set have decreed Canada's little festival that could a must. <laughs> that, of course, is Robin Williams, Claudia Schiffer. It's the only film festival in the world where you see all of the most important films. You see a whole year come in advance. As un-Canadian as it is to gloat, movie critic Roger Ebert says go right ahead. Yeah, it's okay, Canada. It's okay. It's a real big, real good festival. This is one of our four-year-old classrooms, and this is an observation window, so they can't see us out here, but we can observe uh, the interaction with the kids. People in Flint, Michigan are committed to a chilling task. They closely watch local children for signs of brain damage after exposure to lead in the drinking water. That's a big fear, and the youngest and smallest are especially vulnerable. Stephen D'Souza went to Flint and found a city that's pulling together while fearing the worst. Sarah Kahn's kitchen can be a busy place, but one part that doesn't get much attention, the faucet. They don't even give the tap water to the dog. Just normal things like brushing your teeth or trying to make food or even give water to your pets. Everything's from bottled water. We first met Sarah and her son Casimir last year at the height of the crisis. That's it. That's it. We were along when she had him tested for lead exposure, and the news wasn't good. Did I miss home while I was there? I sure did. His test came back showing high levels of lead in his system from drinking untreated water. But because lead only stays in the system for three months, and they had been drinking it for almost a year, it wasn't clear from the test how much had seeped into his body. I get really emotional about it because I have no idea the effects it will have. Um, he could have cognitive problems and behavioral problems when he gets older, and I won't know for sure if the lead is why. Her story, sadly, is by no means unique. Not in Flint, where an estimated 5,000 children were affected by tainted water. 
It began in spring 2014, when Flint switched its water supply from Detroit system to the Flint River to save money. The city didn't properly treat the more corrosive river water, causing lead from the aging pipes to leach into the system. Residents immediately began reporting discolored, foul-smelling water, rashes and reactions. But nothing was immediately done. State and local agencies blamed each other for what was revealed to be nearly 18 months of inaction. Last winter, it blew up into a national crisis. Breaking news tonight. It's a disaster. The public health crisis. The toxic water in Flint, Michigan. The president today declaring a state of emergency. Since then, more than a dozen officials have been criminally charged, and the investigation continues. Residents have also launched a $720 million lawsuit. Dealing with the fallout has transformed daily life here. This is no ordinary preschool. The only requirement for admission is to be a child who is poisoned by lead. Lead is a neurotoxin, and the young are most vulnerable to lead exposure as their brains are still developing. Teachers here are trained to look for signs in how the kids act and learn, looking for changes in behavior, and trying to figure out if it's normal childhood development or the lead effect. I feel like the earlier you can get a child that may have been affected by the lead crisis, if they have any like symptoms as far as um, the behavior changes or it may have cognitive development issues, you guys ready? the earlier that you can catch that, the more that they will be successful in the future. And it's where Sarah Khan brings Casimir every day. She's confident it's helping. He'll come home and the way like he has new skills that I notice all the time, like problem solving skills, and like he'll put his finger up and be like, I have an idea. Make no mistake, this school's existence is a bitter testament to the powerful and long-term effects of lead poisoning. There are children here who weren't even born when the crisis was at its peak. They were exposed to lead in the womb. This is one of our four-year-old classrooms, and this is an observation window, so they can't see us out here, but we can observe uh, the interaction with the kids. So Another reality, this is one giant experiment. Our motto, it's play. Bob Barnett is the Dean of Education at the University of Michigan, Flint. We're really on the forefront of the research because this has never happened before on this, this scale. And the scale is about to get bigger. This school is maxed out with a waiting list. That's why ground was just broken for a second school. The sad irony is not lost on Barnett. On the one hand, it's some of the greatest work that I've ever been involved with, and we're helping kids who would not otherwise have a chance at getting the kind of help. But knowing what caused this is, it, 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 how can you help but not be angry at a, a system where the trust has been eroded? Please, I'm a team. Clearly, these kids don't have that anger. As we discovered, they're just really, really curious, happily oblivious to the fact they may have been saddled with the handicap so soon out of the gate. So the young people are armed. But what about the older kids, those who do know that they have been poisoned? Kent Key knows about that. He's a researcher at Michigan State's College of Human Medicine, and he's been talking with teenagers and their parents. She was sharing with me that her young son, who he, know, he normally did not have issues in, in school, not even with grades. And all of a sudden his grades was dropping, his enthusiasm about school was like dwindling. And so she asked me to speak to him and he mentioned to me, he said, well, Dr. Key, they said we're not going to be smart anyway because we drank the water. Photo voice is a methodology that is used. He's come up with a proposal to help combat the sense of hopelessness he's found amongst Flint's teens and preteens. It's something he did with tobacco and kids. Give them cameras and let them document their own story something called photo voice. I believe it, it will give them a sense of hope and also allow them to see that you don't have to succumb to the messaging that has been portrayed. More than a year later, normal life here still means weekly pickups of bottled water at one of the numerous distribution centers around town. It also means watching the slow progress being made on replacing the city's aging pipes. That right there is one of the lead pipes that's at the heart of the problem here. As you can see, it's not easy to rip out and replace. So far, the city has done about 800 in the last year, but they still have thousands of more homes to go. And the estimate is going to take at least another two to three years to get it all done. 
But as we discovered, even that might not be enough for some here. Will I, will I use my water now? I don't know. There is a lot of mistrust here, aimed at every level of government. So much so that even though recent tests show the water is now safe, many residents refuse to drink it. Adding insult to injury, their water bills kept coming. And while the state did subsidize some of it, that has now come to an end. I used to work really hard to provide a way for my family, and it's not, it's not possible right now because the water, what the water has done to, to, to me and my family. So we continue to pay for poison. In Flint, they're placing their trust in each other that the solutions to their problems will come from within. Kent Key was born and raised here. So too was Sharnice McGee. Both feel a sense of responsibility to bring hope to Flint's families. So much stuff going on within the economy itself that we just want families to know. You, you, you can trust us. You can trust us with your child. You can trust us with their education. And as long as we have that relationship together and that partnership, we'll be good. Sarah hopes that's true. And while for Kaz's sake, she needs to remain optimistic, like many parents here, there's always doubt. Sometimes I wish I never moved here. Sometimes I blame myself for not realizing what was going on. For Flint residents, that nagging doubt may ebb and flow, but it will never truly go away. The only question, how heavy a burden will each child carry with them? I don't know for sure, and I'll never know for sure the rest of his life or my life, and that's one of the hardest things. They're not being honest about The answer won't come quickly. Progress here will take time, and the true lead effect won't be measured in months or years, but decades. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Flint, Michigan. Straight ahead, Syrian refugees find an echo of their rural past. It's a match made in Canada, right after this break.
A year ago, three Syrian refugee families arrived in Nova Scotia to start new lives after leaving behind their farms in the old country. They'd been living in Halifax but dreamed of getting back to the land. Now, thanks to a farmer in the Annapolis Valley, they are, and growing a new future. Shana Luck has their story. On the first day in the orchard for the new recruits, they're learning how to prune the Canadian apple trees to get the most sun on the fruit. The growing season's different between Canada and Syria. The mutsus and honeycrisps are also different varieties. But to three families who moved to Nova Scotia a year ago, this is a chance to return to the work they know. Al Yawam. Is that close? Am I close? Yeah. Alison Marr owns yeah. this farm. She brought all, all this together. She uses her thumbs to talk with her new employees through Google Translate and sign language. One fellow, he said to us at our kitchen table, he said, I, I can't be in the city, I can't be here. He said, I had a big farm in Syria, I had 40 acres, and now I have a balcony. My body is sick, I can't be just on a balcony. Mara's family farm is far bigger than 40 acres. She needed to take on extra help. And she was moved by the plight of the Syrian refugees. So she called the local Immigrant Settlement Association to see if they had people with experience. A farming has become like a four-letter word in our culture. Nobody wants to say they work on a farm. And, you know, part of the problem is you can't get farm employees. And these people are pleased as punch to be outside and back to something that they can relate to. Did you see Olivia today? Mar and other Aylesford residents prepared a house, a car, everything they thought the new employees might need. This family's youngest son tells us how good his mother is at growing things. She said uh, something like, every my life in a farm like this. Yeah. Her whole life has been on a farm like this. Yeah. Certainly we Meanwhile, the Provincial Immigrant Settlement Association is watching to see how it goes in Aylesford. People need to feel comfortable um, uh, where they're going to settle and integrate. And this was, uh, you know, a maybe downtown Halifax is not it. Finish! Yay! Yay! <laughs> the three farming families are sticking close together for now, helping each other adjust to rural Canadian life. The families who came to Aylesford still have a lot to learn, but they've brought their farming background with them, and those are some welcome skills around here. Shana Luck, CBC News, in the Annapolis Valley. Now, please stay with us for some science news, like what we can learn watching lightning from space. But first, it's time to check the day's business numbers. The TSX increased 21 points. No change to the dollar. In New York, the Dow lost 51 points. Price of oil, it dropped 13 cents a barrel. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, Silicon Valley tech companies have raised the ire of many San Francisco residents for driving up living costs and changing the bohemian dynamics of city life. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. The computer is not an evil genius. It has, so far, neither character nor sex, but it is our indispensable tool for collecting, sorting, and disseminating information. You feel premarital sex is all right under certain circumstances. This young lady is seeking a husband the scientific way. The process begins with a psychological examination. By personality test and depth interview, he reduces her to a punch card, and he runs her through an electronic sorting machine. It matches her personality to suitable men. Well, right now, we're lobbying in various countries around the world to get laws passed which will control the use of computers, especially where large dossiers of information on people exist without any, any uh, safeguards for the people. It's anonymous information. You never know who's asking for such information. I think we need uh, a, a kind of licensing structure for computer use, just as we have licensing structure for doctors. Uh, we have licensing for dentists. We have other professions which deal with man very basically, and the computers do. The electronic web, privacy in the computer age. We are living in a new world of electronic processing of information and simply information gathering on a scale that we've never seen before. You don't know what happens to personal information once you give it to someone. It can be stored, transferred, linked, matched. All kinds of things can happen. Updating the messages people have left, clearing out the old ones, and writing new ones takes the guys about nine hours each day. 
But by doing it, they found fun, friendship, and girls. I have a girlfriend from the madam. Yes, I do. <laughs> Information sharing is so phenomenal, so widespread, that it would be impossible to, to control. It really is impossible to control. Is there such a thing as privacy, then? No, no, there hasn't been privacy since, uh, well, probably about the mid-80s. We've built a beast that we can't cage. So envision now the way society can be moving in which we don't spend the time to get to know each other. We now do searches. We now do private investigations before we commit ourselves to the traditional ways of creating friendships and uh, acquaintances. I don't know, usually I would say probably an hour a day, if not sometimes more. That's how much time Grody usually spends on this website. Facebook is the latest craze when it comes to online friend network. You just want to know what everybody's doing and check the pictures they put up and whether you're invited to any events. And For most of the reason, I don't know why I check so much. Privacy was once a sacred value in our society. Now we are bearing our psyches to strangers. The National. Seeing lightning from space isn't just beautiful, it can give forecasters valuable data. Now they're getting it through a recently launched U.S. government satellite. The geostationary lightning mapper tracks flashes and can reveal when storms are weakening or gaining strength. To the electrical storm in our brains for researching the impulses behind our impulses, three scientists were given the prestigious Brain Prize. For decades, they studied the neurochemical processes behind rewards and how we chase them, even when it's harmful. Their reward? Nearly $1.5 million. Well, from climate science to neuroscience and everything in between, there's one guy we know who can tackle it all. It's that time of year again when CBC's science correspondent Bob McDonald takes on your questions. Questions like... Why are planets round, or are they? Why do cats always land on their feet? Or why, if the Earth is spinning, don't we feel dizzy? Send us your questions for Bob by email to thenational at cbc.ca, on Twitter to at CBC the National, or if you're watching us on Facebook, ask your question in the comments section. Before we go tonight, here's a look at a story we're bringing you tomorrow night. I'm Nala Ayad in Tehran. What are Canadians doing in Iran's oil and gas fields? They could be doing a lot more if it weren't for the delicate diplomatic obstacles. I'll have that story for you tomorrow on The National. That's The National for tonight, Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.